I love that there was, you know, again, early on, uh, Matt was very much a part of the development of the show. Obviously, he created it, but I'm talking about finding the voices, and and uh, we recorded it actually on the Marge Simpson stage on uh, on the Fox lot, where they record the Simpsons. And Matt worked really intensely with me on developing the voice of Kiff. He really wanted Kiff to have, you know, uh, a certain quality. And um, so we stopped the recording and Matt and I went off into a corner. He said, I want him to sound, okay, he's like if Spock had to deal with William Shatner <laughs> instead of Jim Kirk. So the, the, the test line was, uh, you know, sir, I don't think the rest of you share a passion for the Lord. Well-known line. So it was one of the first things Kip says. So I did it as Leonard Nimoy, and I went, sir, it seems the rest of the crew doesn't share your passion for velour. And he said, okay, good Nimoy, but it doesn't sound like it would come out of that mouth. I want him to sound tired. And I was like, okay, I always thought, I always thought Truman Capote sounded exhausted, so I did it like, Sir, it seems the rest of the crew doesn't share your passion for velour. He said, okay, all right, but I wanted to sound pissier, like John Lovitz. So I went, sir, it seems the rest of the crew doesn't share your passion for velour. <laughs> and I'd just done like two years on The Critic with John Lovitz, so I had a good sense of him. And he said, okay, now combine those two. So Kiff became an amalgam of John Lovitz and Truman Capote, and yeah, Vincent Price in there too. I, just, I don't know if there really is. Maybe it sneaks in and I don't know. Because I saved, I saved Vincent Price to Walt. <laughs> yes, mother. Please slap the other two. Don't slap me. So, but what Mo is saying is that that's the, um, you know, like they say, anatomy of uh, voice performance. Like you have somebody like Matt who created the character trying to explain to bring it out of us what he's looking for. And, and uh, you know, our job is just give him what he wants. Just yeah. Give him. I mean, we're clay. That's, that's, yes. You know, there's no ego involved. We're invisible. It's, it's not about us. It's about the characters. So I just, I just wanted to become whatever. And I don't know if Matt ever heard Kiff in his head the way I did it, but I think I, I, I molded myself to, to the directions that Matt, he was very happy with it. And, and they, they started making Kiff and Zap a main feature of the show. And I know with Fry, you, it's just amped up you, right? Well, originally, when we were auditioning for Futurama, um, we went to the Fox building over on St. Paul for that Boulevard in uh, way West Hollywood. And uh, I walked into that room and there was 200 people uh, sitting around waiting to audition. And I'm like, oh Jesus, there's Ryan Stiles. He's gonna, Ryan. he's gonna mop the floor with this audition. And I said, I, maybe I'll stay, I don't know. And and I did stay and I sat with Matt and David Cohen and I was supposed to audition for Joe Edberg and the professor. And just because I had seen a couple of pictures of them, I sort of knew what I wanted to do. The professor was just a, a, a collection of doddering wizards and mad scientists and, you know, um, What's the other thing? Like, uh, like wizards. Yeah. Yeah. And um, and he was rickety because he's 147 years old. So I said, Jesus, he probably farts dust, you know. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, and I, and I played it up. And Zoidberg just had that look about him. And he had all that junk hanging off his mouth. And I said, it would be impaired. You know, I'd be like, I'm telling you, you know the definition of a smart ass? A fellow that can sit on an ice cream pot and tell you what flavor it is. That's <laughs> <laughs> silly. For some reason, people thought that was funny years ago. But uh, <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, um, they um, they pulled off Fry at the last minute. I had no idea I was going to audition for Fry. Yeah. Yeah, because they had already cast him. Right. And. Um, so they pull out this picture and I look at it and I go, oh, Jesus, I had to pull something out of nowhere. And I said, maybe he's 25. I'm going to try and remember what I sounded like when I was 25, which was all whiny and nasally and complaining. And I was always loud, you know, and I, I played in the band and it's like, shit, I broke a string. Now what are they going to do? You know, everything was like, <laughs> and um, he was me, Fry in a way, and, and he's all over the place, but his heart's in the right place. So he's a perfect match for Leela, who's strong and decisive, 
I think it just worked out that way. And uh, it's that Matt Granning magic where things just kind of come together. Yeah, it was perfect. Yeah. So how did it happen that you came to like voice other roles? Was it, you know, another audition or was it, we know your range. Let's try characters X, Y, and Z. Sometimes it's a toss up, you know, like um, the, something will happen in the script. There's some character and David Cohen will go, anybody want to try it? You know, and we'll all give it a shot. And, um, you know, it just depends on what, what rings true or what's funny or, you know, you, you go with what works. You know, no harm, no foul. Whoever does it, does it. Yeah, I mean, I, I was, uh, I was always uh, very uh, cognizant. Of that. Well, for example, like we all do, you know, multiple voices. I, I mean, and, and on the critic, I would sometimes have two and three pages of dialogue where it was me talking to me, mm-hmm. or me talking amongst myself, as I like to call it. You know, where I play all, you know, all three characters in a, in a movie parody, like Keanu Reeves and Jean-Luc Picard in, you know, Star Trek, the, 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 uh, the uh, Generation X or whatever. And, and, you know, so I brought that to uh, Futurama, and I know Billy ha- has always had that. So we, we play multiple characters. Where I've always worried about that, for instance, Morbo, which Morbo started out not as, I didn't, not the way I do him. He, he was actually... Uh, the way we originally recorded him, it, 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 he he was like the McLaughlin group. He was John McLaughlin, and then yes, yeah, and then and then they just wanted to sound more monstery. And I already had laid down Lur, ruler of the planet Omicron Percy. I hate. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> when I decimate this planet, you'll be spared. Um, and. Uh, so I wanted him, to, you know, they said, make him sound more monstery. So I wanted to be able to put him up against Lur and have him not sound like the same guy. So I decided, you know, Morbo was more, his voice was a little deeper and a little more stentorian because he was a newscaster, <laughs> even though he was waiting for his people to come and destroy you. So, you know, you're leaving out the huge gelatinous blob. Oh, it, but HGB. I think they were all horrible. Horrible gelatinous blob was the first of the deep gravelly voices that I did. <laughs> he just sounded like this. He was wrong. He just, you know, consume anybody and they'd float his stomach. So I've always wanted to do an episode where the three of them, or, you know, or the two of them are on Morbo's talk show and do the separation among the three characters. Uh, but they, they haven't gone for that yet because I would just, it'd be worse than fan service. It'd be more research service. So, <laughs> and they're not into that. They're into making me work. Damn it. It kind of sounds like when it comes to a scene and even if it's you playing off of yourself, it's all your characters. It sounds like maybe you just go for it as opposed to breaking it down like, okay, I'm going to do all the lines of this character and then this character. Oh, no. No. That okay. would be boring. No, no. To, to actually... Jump back and forth amongst the characters and is exciting. It's exciting as an actor. And if you did it any other way, it would take two weeks to record. Right. So we just record whole yeah. scenes. We just record whole scenes. And if we're playing multiple parts, well, then that's, you know, we do it as if it's radio. Mm-hmm. You know, if we yeah. had a Jack Benny show, we you know, and, and we were, you know, Mel Blank and Phil Harris, we'd just be doing a bunch of multiple characters as we do the radio show that's just that's just the way it works and it keeps you alive as an actor to keep switching intent keep switching what the character wants for you know and then what does that character want what does this character dread what does that character dread so you know it's it's it it, it, to keep waking up different internal lives is very exciting as an actor except when we did a table read a few weeks back and um my worst nightmare would be to start reading and in the wrong character's voice. <laughs> I never really did it. That has happened once or twice. With me, me as twice. Well. With me as well. And like since 1999. Oh my God. And, and the room went deathly silent while I was reading and Johnny DiMaggio was like, Professor, Professor, it's the Professor. <laughs> oh. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Do the Professor. Huh? Do the professor. I don't want to live on this planet anymore. <laughs> Yikes. Uh, if anyone's looking for me, I'll be in the anger dome. <laughs> oh, I know. There's a great line that he had. Someone reminded me. Who needs courage when you have a gun? 
Ha, ha, ha.